So the first two, there we go. He did get one taker. Um, the first couple of sessions I did, I was basically trying to set the table for my fellow speakers. Um, today I get to have my fun in this hour. Um, and with what we've tried to build with establishing a firm chronology, and again, we didn't have time to go through it to such a depth where I could prove to you conclusively every little jot and tittle of it. Um, you know, time didn't allow that, but that the resources that I pointed to you uh, can and, sh and I think should do that. Um, so what we want to do in our time now is look, is assuming that we've got the right dates, that 967 is the right date. Sorry, Dr. Merrill. Uh, 967 is the right date for the uh, beginning of the building of the temple, the first temple, and then that takes us back in the 480th year before that, the Exodus happened, that's 1446. And if Exodus 12, 40, and 41, the textual variant there is correct that it's only in Egypt uh, in that text. And so the sojourn of 430 years where they left after that to the very day, that backs us up from 1446 BC to 1876 BC. So if that basic framework, chronological framework is correct, then um, the historical evidence should fit that. And at the end of the day, that's the litmus test. There are lots of views out there that don't have support from the material. Uh, how many people do you know who put on conferences, uh, and um, uh, maybe Randy, you, you'll be able to answer this, how many people are, who, who hold to the late Exodus view are able to hold conferences and show you hour after hour of evidence supporting a 1267 BC or so year of the Exodus? Do, do you know of such conferences that go on? that do that? Tried. Do they have evidence? Well, they claim they did. But, you know, archaeology fits the time period, whatever they choose. Yeah, and, and the, the evidence they're presenting is, in every case I've seen, very, very, somewhere between limited and refutable. So, um, so but the bottom line is, it doesn't fit their system. And again, as I said yesterday, if, if a 1267 or so BC Exodus is correct, then much of what I've written in my two books automatically has to be wrong, if not, if not everything. It all has to be wrong. So you have to rationalize away the evidence that's there. And so far, nobody has published anything to refute my two, uh, the theses in my first two books. Nobody, why? Where are they? They should be demonstrating that it's false. So what I wanna do is highlight some of the evidence um, for you uh, that verifies this. Historical evidence from um, Egyptology and the related fields. So chronological framework for synchronizing Israelite and Egyptian history. So we're going to start with um, our chronological scheme. Uh, and remember, those are our two important numbers in yellow, 1446 BC is the Israelite exodus from Egypt. We talked about the exact date, and I said that it was the 24th of April, 1446, in the evening uh, after sunset when they um, participated in the first Passover event, and then the morning on that same day in the Hebrew calendar, the next morning on the 25th in, in our uh, time frame, uh, the exodus took place. Then in 1406, the Israelites crossed into Canaan. And by the way, the biblical text is very clear in the book of Joshua, uh, giving us the exact day in the Hebrew calendar when that happened. And that's in my, uh, that's recorded, uh, and I, I, you know, put that on our calendar, the, that exact date in my 2008 journal article published in the Journal of Evangelical Theological Society on the site of Chatzor. So that's downloadable from my academy.edu webpage if you want to look at it. All right, and then the, and so we're just reviewing here quickly before we launch into the evidence. So the Egyptian chronolo chronological scheme, because we want to be able to synchronize the two, but first we have to place Egypt, uh, Israelite chronology in the right position, and then we have to place Egyptian chronology in the right place. And then, uh, and only then can we synchronize them. So, um, we're in the, f for what we're looking at mainly, we're looking at um, the, the Exodus being in the 
in the New Kingdom in the 18th dynasty, which um, the New Kingdom is from 1560 to 1069. All right, um, the first support that I'm going to show you from the Bible and from uh, um, which comes from the Bible and from extra biblical sources. So the chronological reference in 1 Kings 6.1 is clear. The Masoretic text reads 480th year and is supported by the Vulgate against the Septuagint's reading of the 440th year. Solomon's building of the first temple undoubtedly began in 967. And the source there again, if you want to confirm that 967 is the right year, uh, is several of the journal articles written by Roger C. Young. Those are available on his academy.edu webpage and on his own personal website if you're interested. Um, and of course, in my book, in my newer book, the 2021 book, Origins of the Hebrews, I list that evidence there so you can see it there and get you know the, the exact bibliographic and the page numbers. All right, second, the Jubilee dates are precise only if the priests began counting years when the Israelites entered the land in um, the land of Canaan in 1406 BC. The Talmud lists 17 cycles from Israel's entry into Canaan until the last recorded Jubilee in 574 BC. And of course, where are the Israelites in 574 BC? In Babylon, this is Babylonia. Um, if using the Tishri calendar. A similar statement is found in chapter 11 of Seder Olam, an early rabbinical writing that predates the Talmud. And there's the source right there, Roger Young's 2006 article for this in the Westminster Theological Journal. Uh, in Judges 11.26, Jephthah stated in a letter to the king of Ammon. So this is also, so we have evidence now from the book of Judges to confirm um, that that a date of in or around, and for me it's in, 1446 BC is right for the Exodus, and 1406 BC is right for the beginning of Joshua's conquest. So um, here in Judges 11, Jephthah stated in a letter to the king of Ammon that for 300 years, right? This is really important. R remember what the other view is? Uh, 215 years for 300 and for 300 years, Israel, and that's probably a round number, by the way, Israel occupied Heshbon, Aror, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon River. Although it is impossible to calculate precise dates for Jephthah's judgeship, it probably lasted from right around 1088 to 1083 BC, according to Andrew Steinman's book. Using these dates, the end of the conquest would be in 1388 BC, but the 300 years likely is a rough number. The tribe of Reuben thus has been occupying or had been occupying the disputed area from the Wadi Heshbon to the Arnon River since about 1400 BC. So the, the 300 year number for the period of the judges, and that doesn't mean it's the exact date of every uh, judgeship, you know, from the beginning of the first one to the end of the last one, that's not the point but it, it included at least a period of 300 years time. This is very clear from the text, and this is a Hebrew text. So, you know, even Jewish people can't get out of this if they don't have as much value for the New Testament. So you're stuck. And this, this refutes uh, the 215 uh, year sojourn view for sure. All right, um, second reason. Amenhotep II meets the Exodus Pharaoh's biographical requirements. And we're not going to go into great depth in all of these um, uh, meeting of requirements, but this can be found in greater depth in my 2006 article on the Exodus Pharaoh and in my newer book also. So Amenhotep II meets the Exodus Pharaoh's biographical requirements, all the ones that must be true of him, that, that are quantifiable, that can be confirmed or disputed, he meets them. Um, so, here are several of those. After synchronizing Israelite chronology with Egyptian chronology carefully, using the high chronology view in Egypt, remember there's a 25-year difference among Egyptologists who accept uh, astronomical data as valid. I'm, I'm among them. Uh, the high chronology view, and then 13 years later is the middle chronology view, and then 25 years after the high chronology view is the low chronology view. So wherever you fit in that, it's only 25 years difference, but high chronology view um, definitely seems to be the right view from all vantage points. 
Amenhotep II is the Egyptian king on the throne in 1446, and that's because he reigns from 1453 to 1416, according to the high chronology. So there it is. That's the, that's the Pharaoh that you put on trial if you're going to start with chronology. And that's what I did in preparation for my 2006 journal, journal article. I first built the framework. I tried to get the chronologies right and, and synchronize them right. And so the first test case was, well, if Amenhotep II fits in, in that window, in that, in that range of time, because the Exodus is within his reign, then now we can, you know, throw the assault against him and see if he can hold up. All right, two, Amenhotep II is not a firstborn son, and he did not die during the 10th plague. Whoever the candidate, the correct candidate is for the Exodus Pharaoh, he could not have died in that 10th plague. Um, and so he, 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 he um, could not also have been a firstborn son. If he were a firstborn son of his father, who was king before him, then he dies. So Amenhotep II doesn't die in it um, like other um, kings who took over as the firstborn son taking over from their father. So this legitimizes him as a candidate for the Exodus Pharaoh. His brother Amenemchat was the, and this is a, a, an official um, administrative title, the king's oldest son. That's what he was, this other, this brother, this, this other son of, of uh, Thutmose uh, the third. He was um, the king's eldest son. Three, Amenhotep II's eldest son, probably Prince uh, Tutmose, uh, never became king. Prince, uh, Prince Amenhotep, who lived to year 30 to 35, uh, that's of his father, Amenhotep II, and never was called the king's eldest son, died while heir to the throne. Amenhotep II's successor, Thutmose IV, or Tutmose IV, clearly was not the king's eldest son. So, there we go. He passes this, this test also. So he remains a valid candidate for the Exodus Pharaoh. Four, Amenhotep II is one of only two kings of dynasties 18 and 19, and I mentioned this yesterday actually, so this is review, to succeed a king who ruled for over 40 years. Moses fled from the Exodus Pharaoh's predecessor who sought to execute him for killing an Egyptian. And that's in Exodus 2.15. Departing from Egypt when, quote, he was fulfilling the age of 40, according to Acts 7.23. Only, quote, after 40 years had passed, did the death angel speak to Moses at the burning bush. And that's Acts 7.30, which is based on Exodus 3.2, which immediately follows the event that in the course of those many days, the king of Egypt died. That is the predecessor to the Exodus Pharaoh. Thus, the king who preceded the Exodus Pharaoh must have ruled beyond 40 years. This criterion is not met by the relatively modest reign of Seti I, who ruled from 1305 to 20, uh, 1290. That's approximately a 15-year reign. So if, if you want to be an advocate, you, know, you're, you want to support Cecil B. DeMille to the umpteenth degree, and you want to say, yeah, the king had to be a Ramesses king. So Ramses II is our candidate because he, he fits. If you, if you want to say that, then you are now violating the biographical requirement that we just looked at, number four here. You can't reign 15 years as, as the predecessor to the Exodus Pharaoh, or, or, or that candidate is out. So, um, you know, my, my colleagues who are late Exodus advocates, they squirm a lot with this issue and they try to manipulate the text. So they, they practice what I call um, uh, abhorrent exegesis to come to the conclusion that somehow we can wiggle our way out of the fact that the predecessor to the um, Exodus Pharaoh ruled over 40 years. It's, it's terrible gymnastics that they do. All right, five, Amenhotep II's second Asiatic campaign was a glorified slave raid with the claim that his human booty topped 100,000 people. So if you compile the human booty, meaning the prisoners, taken by his father, Thutmose III, 
the one who chased Moses out of the wilderness or uh, out into the desert and and ruled over 40 years. Um, if you want to to quantify the prisoners taken in all of the campaigns that he led that are listed, most of his campaigns, he doesn't list how many prisoners, but in the ones that he does, it's, I forget the exact number, um, four, five or six, somewhere in that vicinity, you add all those together and you add together the prisoners taken by Amenhotep II in his first Asiatic campaign, add all of that up, and it, that number is 46 times less than the number of prisoners that are recorded for Amenhotep II's second Asiatic campaign. Isn't that astounding? And when does it happen? According to my chronology, that campaign happens in November, which is not when you campaign in the ancient world as a king. You never do. What season do you campaign? It's in the Bible. Spring. Spring is the time that kings go out, right? And a November campaign is launched. Why? And why is he picking up 100,000 prisoners? Egypt is like machinery. And that machinery operates on all of those parts, right? The gears and the chains and everything else. And if you take away that machine, you know, those important parts, all of a sudden the machine can't run anymore. And the machine in this case is run by the slaves who are Israelites. That's why he launches this campaign in the very year of the Exodus, 1446. Among the prisoners in this second Asiatic campaign, and by the way, in the first Asiatic campaign, he lists no prisoners who are called Apiru, none, zero. In all of the, most of the third's campaigns, he lists no Apiru. Who are the Apiru? They're the Habiru, who are the Hebrews. The first mention of Apiru captured by an Egyptian king. In Thutmose III's reign, his predecessor, right? What we see in Egypt is Apiru are tending to vines in the, in the, uh, in the drawings, in the tomb paintings. They're, they're tending to vines, and that's where the word Apiru is used. So they're in Egypt, not out of Egypt, during the reign of the predecessor of Thutmose III. Does that make sense? But now they're being captured. How can they be captured if they're in Egypt. So other uh, views of the Exodus and its date um, are left wanting with this problem. In Thutmose III's reign, Apiru, there it is, were depicted working as vine dressers. The Apiru Habiru are none other than the Hebrews. And by the way, I don't know if you ever noticed this or not, but in, the, in Moses' first description of, um, of Abram, he calls him the Hebrew. Did you ever notice that? which means Abraham is not the first Hebrew, Isaac is not the first Hebrew, Jacob is not the first Hebrew, Joseph or all of his brothers, they're not the first Hebrews, and the sons of Israel or the, and the grandsons and great-grandsons, they're not the first Hebrews. Somebody before Abram is a Hebrew. So he comes from the Hebrew family. Who, are the, who is the Hebrew family? In Mesopotamia and Akkadian, the Habiru. Do you see that, how that fits? Okay, um, Avaris, biblical Ramses, where Jacob settled, was abandoned during Amenhotep II's reign. So for all the gory details, you can see this in the article I published in 2013, and yes, it's packed with details, but really, I think, powerful and persuasive evidence to show that the, dis that the um, abandonment of the site of Avaris takes place not before the reign of Amenhotep II, not after his reign, not at the end of his reign, but during his reign. Why would it be abandoned? Because Avaris, folks, was the, the, the headquarters for his army and his navy. That's why. It was the city from which his armies would, were launched. But what happened to his armies in April of um, 1446? They went swimming and never came out of the pool. So it all makes sense if these are Hebrews. Um, so this was at the height of Egypt's imperial power. This makes sense if their military base of operations was depleted of its army when they drowned in the Sea of Reeds in 1446 BC. Third reason. So we're basically done with Amenhotep, Amenhotep II or showing why his reign reflects 
that he can be or should be viewed as the Exodus Pharaoh. So the site of Avars provides evidence of Israelite presence in the 18th dynasty. And by the way, folks, I'm not even giving you all of the evidence that exists that's from the 12th dynasty, right, Dr. Milstead? Which is very extensive in its scope. So um, we'll start with the biblical text. Exodus 1, 11 and 2, 12. And guess whose translation this is? Yep, mine. <laughs> so they, that is the Egyptians. So if you see brackets, I've added that for, for context so you understand who, uh, about whom they're speaking. So the Egyptians appointed taskmasters over them, that is the Israelites, over the Israelites, with hard labor. Then they built for Pharaoh storage cities, the cities of Pitom and Ramesses. Now it came to pass in those days after Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. Then he saw an Egyptian killing or striking down. It's one or the other. Only context will tell you if, if it can, which one it is. Um, so the verb itself doesn't tell you if this Egyptian actually died. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't based on just what we read in front of us. Um, then he saw an Egyptian killing or striking down a Hebrew um, one of his brethren. And, you know, if I were a betting man, I'd put my money on that he was killed. And that's very common, I found from the evidence. So here's my historical observation. If the Hebrew word miskanot d uh, does not refer to an armory, um, which would have stored bows, arrows, spears, etc., sizable storage facilities should be visible at the biblical cities of Pitom and Ramesses. At Avaris, large storage silos were built during phase D 1.2, that's stratum E 1.2. If Hebrews were killed by, the, by their Egyptian taskmasters at these sites during the lifetime of Moses, some of their bodies, if found, could show signs of this brutality. At Avaris, non-Egyptian burials of this phase reveal signs of vicious murder. Hmm, interesting. Plot thickens. These deaths and burials occurred between 14 and 34 years before Moses was born, possibly making them Israelite. So, um, phase D 1.2, dates for this, my rough dates, these aren't exact for sure, roughly 1560 to 1535. Amosa the first, and by the way, uh, I spoke to some of you about Amosa the first. This is the Pharaoh that I identify, and it's in my book, as the Pharaoh who arose over Egypt who did not know of Joseph. That's Amos of the first, the last king of the 17th dynasty, first king of the 18th dynasty. So Amos of the first conquest of Avaris against the Hyksos was followed by a rebuilding and reoccupation of the city soon after its liberation. Phase D 1.2 featured a large enclosure wall that was used until Amenhotep II's reign. Hmm, interesting. And that's straight from the archaeologists. What happens during Amenhotep II's reign? Avaris is abandoned. A palace with a large paved hall and a, at least 30 circular granary silos built safely within the enclosure walls. The silos could store an enormous quantity of grain because they were five, uh, five and a quarter meters in diameter. That's massive. In area H3, a foundational deposit and an execration pit were found between the Hyksos palatial compound, which is below, and a huge newly constructed Egyptian storage complex that is above that was used during phase D1. The foundational deposit, a ritualistic pit placed beneath or alongside the foundation of a building to dedicate a structure, included a ring-based bowl, a model hoe, and two sieves. That's all pretty academic, right? The execration pit also contained three male human skulls and three right hands. Egyptians loved to collect hands of dead people, especially the ones they kill. One of the skulls had a hole on its right side. Hmm, how do you get a hole in a skull? It's not your average everyday situation. Most people aren't buried with holes in their skull probably resulting from a violently piercing blow that damaged the right temple. Datable potsherds accompanied the remains. Well, Moses was born in 1526 BC, if you remember. 
The most distinctive feature of phase D 1.1, which dates, and again, my rough dates, between 1535 and 1506. So obviously, if Moses is born in 1526, he fits in this time frame, right? So the most distinctive feature of this phase at Avaris is pit graves without any offerings, consisting of single or multiple burials of people lying, and get this, face down. Newsflash, the Egyptians didn't bury their people face down. Hmm. On their chests or in a haphazard position. Hodgepodge. The majority of these burials offered, I'm sorry, occurred in a special complex, but almost all contained the remains of, and get this, young men, males and young, approximately 18 to 25 years of age, with some having been executed ritually. Who would have been the best builders for the Pharaoh during, during the time the Israelites were building? Young men. I mean, they've got the strength. I mean, if somebody takes me out as a slave and has me build things, I'm telling you what, I'd probably, at my age, I'm almost 60. I, I'd be, because all the nook, you know, problems in the, in the joints, I, it, it would be so slow that probably I would be lashed to death. But if you're 15, you know, or 18 to 25, you can get a lot more done a lot faster and keep on going. Some of the executions seems to have been brutal, a type unattested in Egypt. So you can't find these kinds of burials anywhere in Egypt, in the ancient world. Skeletons of two men buried face down were found in execration pit L1016, partly atop one another. One headless. Hmm. I doubt they were brothers embracing, you know, when they died. It probably was something far more vicious. About 380 smashed pottery vessels were broken over their skeletons. And by the way, that's a, a ritual practice. But it's usually not done with actual dead bodies. It's usually done with figurines. But here they did it with bodies. Normal Egyptian practice was for clay figurines of enemies to be substituted for the actual enemies with their names inscribed on them. So you just write the name of the person on that figurine and then set it down and then you break pottery vessels over it to show that, and really what you're doing is you're calling upon the gods to you know, send down lightning or fire on that person, to kill that person, to make life difficult or painful, that kind of thing. So you really want bad things to happen to your enemy when you do that. Um, so, there, um, so here is grave six and seven um, that you're kind of seeing it on a large scale here. So this is phase D 1.1. Remember, this is Moses's, the, the life, the, during the, the, the time that Moses was born, that's the time frame for these. So Moses was about 20 years old at the end of this occupational phase. And here you can see pit graves without burial offerings. So you see um, the lack of feet here. You see the lack of a leg bone here. And that's the tibia, right? That's the tibia bone. Um, doesn't look like we see a hand here, if I'm seeing correctly. I'm not a doctor. Doesn't look like we're seeing a hand here. This may be a hand I'm... Yeah, that may be a hand, but, you know, no hand here. So that's what we're getting. These kinds of burials are found. And again, multiple, in many cases, multiple people buried in the same grave. And that's not, that's not standard in Egypt. That's very atypical. Execration pit 1016, the deceased were buried face down with one body headless and the other uh, body atop of it. Uh, over them were pottery, chips, and stone, and quartzite fragments. Even more burials of this type were found outside the compound, some containing up to three victims apiece. Mass burials with, with uh, limbs and body parts and, and part of the skeletal structure not even there. This was utter brutality at its worst. This is like ISIS, folks. That's what this is like. Maybe even worse. I don't know. All right, um, so this slide is an image from my first book, The World's Oldest Alphabet. This is one of the early alphabetic inscriptions that I painstakingly um, transcribed. And by the way, this is one of the ones that took the longest because it's most difficult to read uh, many of the letters. It, it just took um, probably between a month and two months to do all of the work, and that was pretty concentrated work. That's how much it was. Um, so this is Sinai 349, 
See if this has any recollection for you. So this is from Serbit el Khadim. This is the place where the Israelites um, were taken down as, excuse me, slaves during the New Kingdom during Dynasty 18, uh, down into Sinai. They, they worked the mines as slaves to, to extract this turquoise to help make the crown rich. And almost all of the uh, inscriptions from this time frame are pessimistic, unlike the Hebrew inscriptions from earlier times before the actual uh, uh, enslavement of the, of the Israelites began and so forth. And as I mentioned to some of you, I think um, it was 114 years that they were enslaved. 1560 BC is when that would have started. So um, these mines uh, date to, uh, and here's how they're dated. There's pottery that was found by uh, William Flinders Petrie that, that dated these, mi- these uh, turquoise mines of the New Kingdom to the reigns of Thutmose III and Amenhotep II, which means the pottery is, is of a style that's used kind of overlapping between both reigns. So, um, so the inscriptions that, that, that were written or inscribed right into the stone, the, uh, the walls um, made of stone, these inscriptions um, would have been um, inscribed during the reign either of Thutmose III or Amenhotep II, one or the other. And again, Amenhotep II is the Exodus Pharaoh. Thutmose III is the one who chases Joseph, uh, Moses out of Egypt. So that's the time frame based on the pottery, right? Make sense? So here's the reading. He, whoever he is, sought occasion to cut away to barrenness our great number, our swelling without measure, Right, And that word for swelling, it's the Hebrew word that's used of a woman who's pregnant. What happens to your tummy area, ladies? Swells a lot. Thankfully, I will never know throughout eternity what that's like. But you do. Swelling without measure. They yearned, meaning the Israelite people, and I'm interpretive, that's interpretive on my part. They, the Israelite people, yearned. They cried out from their inner beings, their their um, guts for Hathor. Who's Hathor? Hathor is the Egyptian deity that's connected with Asherah from the land of Canaan. That's who Hathor is. And Hathor was the patron deity at Serebit el Khadim. So when there was there was a, um, a cutting away to barrenness of the great number of the Israelite people and they were swelling without measure the people cried out to whom? To the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Mm-mm. To a pagan deity. And this is why Ezekiel, in Ezekiel it's recorded that, that the Lord speaking, he said, he said that, that your fathers played the harlot while you were in Egypt. Isn't that amazing? That's like, you know, reverse prophecy. And so here's, here's evidence for the first time in history that they actually did that. They played the harlot. They went after Hathor. And they, they begged her to um, help them. And by the way, the, um, the imagery behind Hathor, does anyone know what we connect Hathor with? What, what animal? The cow. Hmm. What do the Israelites worship? Golden calf, right? You see the connection? Nothing new under the sun. It's what they were used to worshiping. But, the quiver, and what is a quiver associated with in the Bible? Arrows, Arrows but children. children also, yes. But the quiver of our brothers was thoroughly dispra- despised, meaning the king and the Egyptians despised seeing us grow in number through bearing children. They despised that altogether. So he, whoever he is, performed terror against their quiver and brought about a cry of wailing. Does this remind you of anything? Does it ring any bells? What event? The sl- slaying of the male children at the birth time of Moses. And this is probably composed between roughly 1480 and, you know, 1447 or something BC in that neighborhood. And so at that point, they were looking back to the time when that slaying took place, which remember Moses was born in 1526. 
So it's only a, ma a matter of, you know, whatever it is, three or four decades, uh, or five decades at the most, whatever. Um, so they, they have not forgotten that decades later. They did not forget it. And they're even recounting it here permanently on stone for anyone who would read it in the future. And who would have believed that God would call me to be the one to discover the meaning that's on this inscription? So powerful. Workshop one. In workshop one, so we're back to Avaris, um, Betok's team found two lumps of arrowheads with a total of over 140 bronze arrowheads of Aegean style. These arrows demonstrate that the workshops were used for the production of weapons for military purposes and explain the pumice, which was used in antiquity as an abrasive for poli uh, polishing bronze. So in these workshops they found, and these were converted buildings, they were converted during the, the militaristic campaigning of Thutmose III, they were converted from storage facilities into munitions dumps and workshops to make weapons for warfare. Um, so here is a clump of arrowheads from workshop one. They were all just kind of, you know, sm I don't know what the right word is, verb, smelted together or whatever, corroded together. Um, and then um, once they're cleaned, uh, these are the arrowheads. And you can see that these are, in this case, bronze arrowheads from workshop one. All right, let's go back to the big biblical text. New idea, new, new, new thought here, something different to look at, different evidence. So this is from Exodus 11, 7, 12, 3, 12, 5, and 12, 29, kind of compiled together, my translation. But at any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark. And yes, note what I have in highlights. Dog won't even bark, whether toward man or beast. On the 10th of this month, each man must take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households a lamb or sheep for each household. And by the way, what are we talking about here? What's, what's coming up? First Passover. Your lamb must be an unblemished male in its first year of age. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now it came about at midnight that he who is the covenant name of God, which is what it means, he, the one who goes on existing, struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. So, what are our animals here? Dog, sheep, goats, and cattle, right? Those four. Am I wrong? I mean, you can call my translation faulty, but... No. A large number of animal burials was found in the palatial precinct. What, what is a palatial pr precinct? It's a where the palace or palaces in this case were located. What are, and, and think about this, what are animal burials doing in the palatial district? That's where the wealthy go. That's where the, the, the royals go. That's where the aristocrats go or the, the visiting emissaries from other countries. But we have animal burials in the palatial district. Something's really weird. Though the timing of the burials is disputable. Betok variously dated the burials to the barren phase or the first phase of construction of the late 18th dynasty fortress. And by the way, the barren phase is the period he thinks that the abandonment of Avaris takes place at, right after the reign of Amenhotep II. And so he's attributing the burial of these animals to the barren phase. But think about it, folks. If it's a, if it's a barren phase, who's there? To bury animals. If it's a barren phase, what does barren mean? Nobody's home. That's a head scratcher, Manfred Betok. He's a great archaeologist, but what is he saying? The burials include two bulls and two dogs, but the majority consisted of sheep and goats. Oh my. That's what the Israelites were supposed to take life from those animals with more than 30 such burials. And by the way, the majority of the burials were multiple animals. The majority of the, um, of the, um, okay. So the age of the majority of those animals that died was less than a year of age. 
How old were the animals supposed to be that were the sacrificial animals, the sheep and goats, for the first Passover? Yeah, and actually the English text is a little bit misleading in most translations. It says they're year-olds, which means they're more than one-year-old but less than two, technically, right, in English? But you study the Hebrew term, it's ben shana, which means son of a year. Son of a year means less than a year. It's used of an accession year of a king's reign when he doesn't rule for a, for a full first year. That, you know, three months and ten days is called his accession year. Why? Because it's less than a year. So, actually, <laughs> if this is what I think it is, and I'm convinced it is, then this helps correct, slightly, most of our English translations. It should be less than a year old's. There's one of the bull burials. Oh, and by the way, uh, there was very few pottery found in the graves. Um, the little pottery that was found, guess where it dates to? Guess? Pottery that, that is used during the reigns of Thutmose III and Amenhotep II. So how can it be the barren phase when it's after the reign of Amenhotep II. Does that make sense to you? It's got to be connected to his reign. And the archaeologist said the burials were done very carefully, almost in a religious sort of way, you know, as if that, you know, we're walking on hallowed ground here. There's, there's something, you know, uh, something very wrong, and we have to be very careful in what we do. All right, that's one of the bulls. Here's one of the goats uh, at the end of Stratum C. Um, this is a ram in an unspecified location uh, along the Thutmasid wall. So these are walls of buildings that animals are just being buried there. So basically, the idea is wherever these animals die, they're buried on the spot. That's the idea. Otherwise, you have to explain why in the world you have multiple animal burials, and you have to explain why they're in the palatial district. But it's really inexplicable. The ceramic evidence reveals that these burials date to the final occupational phase of Amenhotep II, which actually fits well with Betok's earlier opinion that the palatial district could have been abandoned by Amenhotep II's government. Perhaps the inexplicability of such burials along the very walls of the palaces at the time of the royal residence's occupation inhibited Betok, that's the chief excavator, the Austrian chief excavator, from connecting the burials to the proper dating based on the pottery. The graves display careful but brief burials, and the majority of them show that the sheep and goats were under a year of age when they died. At least one ram was killed intentionally with a blow to the head by a chisel-shaped tool, which cl clearly was an unnatural death. So what kind of death does it suffer, this, this um, ram? A humane death, intentional right? A ram just doesn't bump into something that's so heavy and strong that it dies. It doesn't work that way. They have strong horns. So um, this shows you that something is rot rotten in the state of Denmark. And here is this ram that was killed by a blow to the back of the head. Same time period, end of stratum C. The fill in the burial pits contained only a few potsherds, almost certainly demonstrating the brevity and speed with which the burials were performed. The excavators noted that, quote, a long time span should not be assumed, end quote, for the duration of these burials. The rapidity of the burials also is reflected in the lack of any cultural context and in the lack of a common orientation, right? It's all haphazard. All of the potsherds date exclusively to strata D to C, and thus no later than the reign of Amenhotep II. As, quote, not a single sherd, that's a pot sherd, broken off piece of pottery, from the Amarna or Ramesside periods was found. So if you like the Ramesside view, right, that Ramses II is the Exodus Pharaoh, the evidence doesn't help you here. So the vast majority of animals found by the excavators was sheep and goats, which numbered about 30, many of which were buried in the same grave, multiple animals in each grave. In 2001, the team stated that all of these sheep and goats died in the first year of life, but subsequent excavations 
uncovered the burials of several adults, such as the case where a ewe died uh, suddenly while giving birth with the lamb lodged halfway outside of the womb. So talk about bad luck. Right when this animal is burying its child, it dies. That's pretty abnormal, isn't it? Each Israelite family was to take a sheep or goat from its herd and slaughter it at dusk, meaning that they were permitted to sacrifice either a lamb or a kid whose first appearance in biblical history dates to Isaac's question to Abram, Abraham as to where, uh, where was the Seth, the lamb that would be slaughtered for the burnt offering. God told Abraham that Isaac would be uh, the offering itself, but when God relented from requiring this, Abraham said that, quote, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. So that's the same word used in Exodus 12. That's what it was supposed to be. The majority of English translations of the Bible state that these sheep and goats were to be a year old, which, is clear, which clearly appears to contradict uh, slightly the age of the sheep and goats that Betok found, nearly all of which died during their first year of life. In other words, the slaughtered sheep and goats of the biblical mandate were seemingly to be between one and two years of age, while the sheep and goats at the palatial compound were under one year of age. The Hebrew text can resolve this apparent contradiction because the phrase Ben Shana literally means son of a year. And this word is normally taken as a one-year-old sheep or goat, um, though some take the similar expression um, in his first year in Leviticus 12.6. Okay, for time's sake, I'm going to skip that last slide. Um, evidence for dating the conquest to 1406 to 1400 BC. Does anyone know our, quit know our quitting hour, quitting moment? Take it and roll, 4.30, okay. Um, so, I'm again suggesting to you 1406 to 1400 is the time frame for the conquest under Joshua. So is there any, any evidence to support this? Well, the conquest of Jericho only fits at the end of the late Bronze Age 1B. And um, so this is under the reasons for dating the conquest to this time frame. Where is Jericho located? This is an east oriented map, meaning east is above, north is to the left, um, south is to the right, west is below. So there's Jericho where that arrow is pointing. It's right above the Dead Sea. Um, and the Israelites, of course, um, Moses, well, let's see if I can pop on the old, um, there it is, laser pointer. So here's Mount Nebo right here. So that's where Moses waved to all the people in Canaan before he died couldn't go in so the people probably went along either this road or one close by it crossed through the Jordan Rift and there they ended up at Jericho where they had their first encounter with enemies that needed to be vanquished all right um, so um, here's the Dead Sea and it's it's almost invisible to you it, it's more whitish than bluish and that's because there's this white haze that's constantly rising up from the Dead Sea. Um, and so where's Jericho? Jericho is located here. So this is part of the Transjordanian Plateau to the east. And these, this is the beginning of the uh, Judean hills that kind of dump into the Jordan Rift Valley. So Tel Jericho, Old Testament Jericho if you like, is located right there where the arrow points. And here is um, a kind of a blow up now of it. You can see that it's not that big. If buildings are this big, right? That is as impressive as Old Testament Jericho was. It wasn't any bigger. So if you thought it was this mega city, well, welcome to disappointment. <laughs> this is a plan of the city of Jericho showing you um, this is the Middle Bronze Age um, revetment wall that was used during the late Bronze Age uh, that encircled the city. Um, this is the Neolithic Tower. If you go and visit the site, everybody won't want you to see this Neolithic Tower. And you have to look way down below uh, ground level on top of the tell to see it. Um, and excavations were done here and so forth. This was the wall around Jericho earlier in its history during the early Bronze Age, which um, for context, Abram lived, I'm convinced, in the, uh, right toward the end of the uh, early Bronze Age 4. 
All right, here's that revetment wall. This is that stone wall that rises up from um, the ground at Jericho. That's the Middle Bronze Age wall that's used into the Late Bronze Age. This is a drawing reconstructing the um, lower city wall. So there are two city walls officially. There's the lower city wall and the upper city wall. Both of them were made of red mud brick. Now, where were they placed? Well, they, the one, the lower one, was placed very strategically. Remember that revetment wall we saw that's made of stone? It rises up. Roughly, this is the um, ground level. I think they're depicting in this as of the time that it was excavated. All of this was excavated. That's where you would stand. So you could dig down and find revetment wall in a foundational sense. Um, and above at the top of this um, wall was uh, this large, this tall um, red mud brick wall. So it was a double line of defense, if you will. It was all the trickier to get into Jericho. How do you penetrate a tall stone wall and then a tall mud brick wall right atop it? Good luck, because what's going to happen with the people who are standing on top of it from above? They're going to fire their arrows and drop their rocks and whatever on you and make life difficult. So there was an area between uh, the lower city gate and the upper city gate. And it doesn't really depict it here, but there's a whole occupational area of the site that's, you know, beyond to, the, to our right of that upper city wall. So where would you want to live if you were going to live at the site? Yeah, the upper city, above the upper city wall. So probably this area was what? The lower rent district, right? The other side of the tracks. Well, when they excavated all of this and found this right here, remember our old friend, the revetment wall that, that existed into the late Bronze Age, which Joshua's destruction, according to, I think, proper biblical chronology, dates it to the end of late Bronze Age one. So that revetment wall is here. Well, look in this purple area, shaded in purple. You know what that is? It says fallen, uh, I don't have my reading glasses on it, fallen red bricks, I believe, fallen red bricks right there. That's what Kathleen Kenyon found when she came and excavated this area. Where does, where does fallen red brick come from? The wall above. So this is the outer red mud brick wall that's collapsed down against the revetment wall made of stone so the stone's not going to move but um at least at least not right in that area but um but the fallen wall makes sense if the israelites are having to get their way into the city and what does it become it becomes a ramp to walk up true so it's pretty smart how god devised all this i think and i'm convinced like many are and can't guarantee it's just an opinion uh, I'm convinced it was an earthquake that God used. At the moment that the marching was done and the trump sounded, God sent the earthquake. Now, technically, that's not a miracle. Technically. A miracle is, is a suspension of A or the natural laws, right? There's no suspension of the natural laws if, if, if it's an earthquake. But, buddy, I tell you, that was one timely earthquake, wasn't it? That on the dot... Clock struck, God sent it. Again. How about the wall torn yeah, and, and Bryant Wood likes to point out, he's my archaeology mentor, and the same for, I'm guessing, Henry Smith would say the same thing. He likes to point out that the fact that the wall fell outward suggests that it was some kind of event that it was either gravity-induced or the people from the inside were breaking their own wall and pushing it outside, right? But when you attack a city... Where does the wall go, conceivably? Inward. So that suggests, that could suggest to us um, a connection that this reflects, you know, God's working behind it to cause the walls to follow gravity and fall downward in front of the revetment wall. More revetment wall and more um, red mud brick wall right here. That's what we have. This area and this area is red mud brick wall. So this used to be bricks. Right? They used to be real legitimate bricks that all tumbled down at the right time. So you're looking at what my view, again, you can disagree. You're looking at debris that was 
the very walls that the Israelites watched tumble when God did what he did, sending an earthquake or whatever he did to bring them down. This is an artist's reconstruction showing you that there were houses between, so there was a lower rent district, wasn't there? Uh, below, um, below that upper city wall and above the, the outer city wall, um, this inner city wall. So, and it also depicts there's a window in the um, house and that fits the archaeology, by the way. Let's see, do I have that slide? Oh, I don't know if I have it. Well, maybe, maybe I forgot that slide, but um, in another slide, it will show you that when, when the earlier excavators were there, and this is before Kenyon and, and Garstang, so Kenyon was in the 50s, and Garstang, an American who believed in the Bible, by the way, Kenyon didn't, he excavated in the 1930s. Um, before his time, there was a, a team of uh, I think it was Austrians and Germans. So there was an Austro-German team uh, led by a man named Karl Watzinger. And it was right around 1906, 1907, somewhere in that vicinity that they excavated at the site. And their plan that they produced showed that there were walls of buildings, uh, houses built right against the city wall. Isn't that fantastic? Which means which means all you had to build, if you were the house builder and that was your house, all you had to build is three walls because you can just borrow the city wall. And if you dig a hole through it, punch a hole through it, you can have a window. And probably they would want to do that. I would want to do that. Brings in some sunlight. And I don't know, you can hang your laundry out of there, whatever you want to use it for. But Bryant Wood suggests, and I agree with him, that um, this is where uh, Rahab would have hung her what was that red linen cord or something, whatever that was, that she hung out, hung out the window? That's it right there. That's what it would look like. So, um, and this is another image. This is colorized showing you uh, what it would have looked like sometime after the moment when the earthquake happened or whatever God did to cause the walls to come down. So you see broken walls here and this area. So the idea is that parts of the wall may be maybe remained at their normal height, but other parts of the wall came down and wherever they came down, that's where the Israelites entered. God didn't need to wipe out the entire wall, did he? He only needed enough entry holes for them to get through and slaughter the people. Um, this is part, this is showing you all this dark grade area. This is burnt layer. What did the Israelites do to the city of Jericho when they were done with it? Burned it with fire. There's evidence of it right there. Um, so everything seems to fit um, the archaeology. Um, from Joshua 6, 18, it says this. Now as for you, keep away from the banned objects, lest you covet the banned objects and take something from the banned objects and turn the camp of Israel into a banned object itself, right? Isn't that amazing imagery? Powerful. And cut it off. What were the Israelites supposed to take from Jericho? That's a question. Anybody? Nothing for themselves. But the precious metals they take for God put in the, in the you know, with, with the tabernacle, right? Uh, with with wherever the, or whatever the supply area was for the things that belonged to God, the utensils that belonged to God. That's the only thing they could take. And it belonged to God, not them. So why were the people banned from having Jericho's spoils? And that's another valid question. Why? Why are they banned from taking the spoils? First, fruits. What does God want from us to show that we have faith? Right? Um, if I go and teach a... Um, an intensive class at some school and they pay me, I don't know how, I don't know how much they'd pay me, but you know, $2,000 or $1,000 or whatever they pay me. What does God want from that? The first fruits. He doesn't want me to wait until I've eaten all my meals that month. And then at the end, when it's convenient and I know I've been taken care of and my family's been taken care of, then I give to God. No, we give him the first fruits. So God wanted to visualize that in Canaan with the cities. Isn't that amazing? That's why he did this. So, 
What did Garstang find? Again, the American excavator in the 1930s who believes, believed in the Bible. I guess, you know, God is the God of the living, right? So he's still alive. He believes in God. Uh, Garstang found these storage jars charred in the fire set by the Israelites to destroy Jericho. And how were they looking? Still full of grain. Wow. What ancient people, folks, what ancient people is so stupid that they would leave jars full of grain and not take it and eat it? What ancient people would do that? Do you know of any? I don't know of any. I'm an archaeologist. I haven't heard of any site where it's full of jars of grain that were left behind by the conquerors. You don't do that. But if you're Israelites and God tells you don't take the food and the grain and other things, then you don't take it. And here's a blown, blown up image of uh, one of these pots, you're looking right at the charred remains, albeit through a black and white photo I know, but still, it's, it's an amazing image of the charred remains in a storage jar that was found by, Kath in this case, Kathleen Kenyon. So Garstang and his ex excavation found some. Uh, Kenyon and her excavation found some. Uh, so, you know, if you could get a license to dig there, you'd probably find some too if you go to another area and start to dig. Now, Bryant Wood, uh, and there's a dispute, of course, about the dating of the site of um, Jericho. When, when did this destruction happen? Everybody agrees that the, that the occupational level associated with this massive destruction that we're all looking at is with what's called City 4, right? Remember, we use numbers in, in archaeology, Roman numerals, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. This is City 4. Who destroyed it and when? And of course, Kathleen Kenyon would never admit that this was Israelites behind it. Um, and what she wanted to do, because Garstang said, hey, everybody, this happened right around 1400 BC. And I think he's right. In 1406, specifically, it happened. So Kathleen Kenyon hears this, you know, she, she knows the story. She's read Garstang's work. She's, she sees the, you know, his publications and what he said in conferences and speaking engagements and she wants to prove that wrong. So what does she do? She tries to prove from the pottery and from carbon-14 evidence that the site was destroyed earlier. Um, and there's a lot I could say about that. There's a lot um, of complicated data. But the bottom line is she's dead wrong. And part of that is proven by Bryant Wood's study of the pottery uh, that's associated with it, which, by the way, uh, he published several articles in 1990, I think it was, on this. And he's about to come out with a volume of, of the excavation report for the site of uh, Kirbet el Makatir, which he's convinced is biblical eye. And he's going to relate the pottery from there with the pottery from Jericho. So you're going to see an updated version of all of his work connecting this pottery to show you that Jericho is contemporaneous, its destruction is contemporaneous with the destruction of Kirbet el Makatir. So this, he, he concluded, is, um, it, well, it's Garstang's pottery. It's, it's some of the uh, pottery that Garstang found there. But he's convinced that based on proper dating methods of the ceramics, this is locally made pottery. It's imitation ware imitating foreign pottery, Mycenaean pottery. So it's decorated with red and black geometric patterns, and it was in use only in the 15th century BC, according to Bryant Wood. Then there's the area of my uh, um, concentration, which is the Egyptian evidence. Um, the first minor of my PhD from the University of Toronto is Egyptian language. I took three years of middle and late Egyptian. That's hieroglyphics, two of the forms of hieroglyphics. And, um, and these are um, what we call renal scarabs, scarabs that, that display um, the cartouche of a certain king who reigned in Egypt. And that helps us date in many cases, if we've got the right dynasties that give us this, this potential, to date very specifically the time frame for them. So in the excavations in tomb five and in tomb four, here's what Garstang found. He found that there is, so this one here, that's Hatshepsut's uh, um, 
her prinomen, which, which means her, her uh, throne name, the name she received when she took um, uh, possession of the crown, if you will. So every king had five names. The throne name is one of them, the prinomen. So that's her name. Um, and then number two here, that's Thutmose the third. Um, you'll see his name. It's not on this side. If you flip it, it's on the other side. Um, but um, let's see. But this is also Thutmose the third. So it's Men, uh, Heper, Ra. Great is the manifestation of Ra. And Ra is one of the Egyptian gods connected to the sun disk. And so this, this hieroglyph right here is the sun disk that you see. So Men, Heper, Ra, that's Thutmose the third. That's his prinomen. And then um, in tomb four, this is really great. I love this. And I guess we're going to probably close with this and get, see if you have questions. Um, so from tomb four is this scarab. And this is the one I love the most. See that cartouche right there? That's that royal name. That is Amenhotep III. Guess when he ruled from? 1407 to 1370 BC. When was this city destroyed according to biblical chronology? 1406. This almost doesn't make it. True? Let's say, let's say it was destroyed in 1408. Should we see a scarab in a tomb of, of, um, of Amenhotep III if, he, if his reign? I'm sorry, wait a minute. Um, is that what I want to do for my analogy here? Uh, oh, let's say that um, the ruler before him, so that would have been Thutmose IV, and his rule... Let's say his rule ends in 1408, and we see a scarab of Thutmose the Fourth here. Um, does that work? Mm -mm, doesn't work. Oh wait a minute, no, it can't be. I had it right in the first first time, didn't I? So um, if Amenhotep the Third rule here it is. If I'm sorry, if Amenhotep the Third rules from 1405 to 1370, should we expect? a royal scarab from his reign in one of the tombs where the people were buried. No, we shouldn't. But since it's 1407, there's a one-year window that it works. So, it, so whoever died, and this scarab was put there in the tomb, and it was sealed, whoever died had to die while he was on the throne. And there's only one year he was on the throne before the city is destroyed. And then is Jericho reoccupied anytime soon after? The destruction under Joshua? No. Hundreds of years it's not occupied, except for Eglon's palace, but that's, that's not a full occupation. So that being true, this scarab shows how precise the chronology is. If it's a couple years off of this, that's it. It doesn't work, but it fits perfectly. All right. So we'll stop right there. Any questions that you have? For me, do we have? Here we go. It's live. It's not Memorex. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course you have one or two. Is it on now? So you may have mentioned this, but I uh, seem to recall reading too that when Amenhotep, uh, after that period, Egyptian history, didn't Egypt enter an intermediate period or a dark age as well? Not right after, no. It was a while. But, and, and late Exodus advocates won't tell you this, probably either because they haven't studied it carefully enough or because they want to hide it from their, you know, because it, it incriminates their view. But it experienced a decline unlike it ever had before. Um, well, I should say this. Um, Egypt was at its height ever in its history from, from the dawn of time until our day today during the reigns of Thutmose III and Amenhotep II because Thutmose III um, launched campaigns that went all the way to the, Medi to the uh, Euphrates River and no Egyptian king had ever done anything like that before. So they were powerful. And all of that went away in year seven of Amenhotep II, the year of the Exodus. And before that moment, 1446, in April, um, the, the powerful kings of the 18th dynasty, they refused to participate in political marriages. Why? Because they were the number one superpower. 
There was another superpower. They, they had an enemy. It's called Mitanni. They're around the Khabur Triangle, the Khabur mm-hmm. re- River region. And, um, and they, were, they were a competitor, but Egypt was greater. And the way you can verify that is the fact that when Mitanni tried to, to have political marriages to make you know, good relations, the Egyptians refused. We don't need to do that. But either late in the reign of Amenhotep II or early in the reign of Thutmose IV, one or the other, if not both, of course, we have Egypt participating in political marriages. That's, that's one. Two, Thutmose III launched 17 campaigns into Asia, and he either went further each time or he consolidated his territory. So it was punitive. punitive. Um, so, and then Amenhotep II, his first campaign, he went all the way up to the buffer zone between Egypt's territory and Mitanni's territory. But in his second campaign, he only went into the, b- about northern, northern, southern Canaan, does that work? Uh, around the Sea of Galilee or so. And remember, what did he do on that campaign? Anybody remember his second military campaign? Captured 100,000 slaves, according to him. Right? 100,000 slaves. That's a rough number. Um, it's unprecedented. So... And then after that, he launched no more Asiatic campaigns. None. Isn't that amazing? Why? What happened to Egypt? No army. army. And what's said in the book of Joshua about Hatsor? It said that Hatsor was was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. And it it said that... um, that it, uh, how does it go? It used to be, uh, chapter 11, verse 10, I'm forgetting now the rest of that verse, but um, it used something like, it used to be that, that um, fear was put into uh, uh, those who were, you know, whatever, messing with the kings of, of Canaan at the time. But you saw an Egyptian ram. Right, you would flee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, And it used to be that way, but it's not anymore. That's the implication. That once Joshua's conquest is over, it's a different story altogether. And there are no more campaigns that go into into, uh, Canaan and beyond that that, um, take enormous amounts of booty like, like they did before that. So those are the kinds of examples to show us it was a different world. After the Exodus, when is Egypt mentioned again? When's the next time they're mentioned again? Ooh, trivia question. Yeah. When are they mentioned next? You may be stumping me on this one. When you get to Solomon and daughter Pharaoh. All the way at Solomon, huh? Yeah. Wow. Why? Yeah. They're not on the map anymore. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And people who tell, try to tell you the most powerful... Uh, king in the history of Egypt, ancient Egypt, is Ramses II. They haven't studied Egyptology if they tell you that. That's not true. It's Thutmose III. All, what what uh, campaigns did Ramses II launch that conquered t- foreign territories? He did very little campaigning. What did he do? He built within Egypt. He was the one showing off what Egypt could be if you had enough people to build it up. Yeah. All right, great, Doug. Whoa, 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 Ro- Robbie, Rob- one quick question, please. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Um, could you comment on what was considered the furthest east border of Egypt at the time of the Exodus? Did it go all the way to the edge of the Red Sea, or was it abbreviated? Well, Egypt controlled, um, well, it depends how you want to define that. So there's a lot of different ways you could define it. Egypt proper only goes to Wadi El Arish, um, but they controlled all of Sinai at the time, all of Sinai. And during, you know, right before the Exodus, they controlled all of Canaan, and they controlled virtually all of Syria, ancient Syria, which goes f- way far north, all the way to the border of southeastern Turkey today. Okay, yeah, El, El Arish was the city yeah. I had in yeah. mind. It went that far then. El Arish is up near the sort of the north, northern border of Sinai. Yeah, and so the road from Avaris, where the Israelites were, the road, it's called the Way of Horus or the Road of Horus. Horus is the king of the gods. Okay. The Way of Horus 
uh, winds around and, and, and goes around. The, remember how the Mediterranean Sea looks like a tongue sticking out to the side? It goes around, and at, at Wadi al Arish, that's the border, and then the road continues, but at that point, it's, it's called, at least by scholars today, it's called the Great Trunk Road, and in New Testament times, it's called the, the Via Maris. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's time to break. Great conference. Great work, Doug. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. All right, we're going to break for dinner. We will be back here, try to get back here by 7.15, 7.20, and we'll have our, our final evening session tonight, okay? So thank you very much.